Dear student, you are welcome in this class. And organic farming is a very, very important subject these days. You must be seeing people, politicians, scientists, general public, most people talk about it, whether they want it or whether they do not want it. Most people speak about organic farming. And this is really not new in the world, organic farming. Before the advent of the chemicals or pesticides or fertilizers, it was all organic farming in the world. Organic farming in general means farming without chemicals, chemicals of any kind. So it was practiced, say, in 18th century, 19th century, early 19th century, and so on. In India, you can see that before the Green Revolution, it was almost organic farming in, the, in India. So I will take you in brief about the history of organic farming uh, all in the world as well as in India. So can you see the slide? Can you see the slide? This is in full mode. Are you able to see the slide? Sir, no, no sir. sir. Not clear yet. No, sir. Not able to see. That is why I now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are able to see. First slide, my picture is there. And this is second slide. You can see it. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So whenever you face any problem, uh, you can ask me to stop uh, because there is no any fun in teaching if you are not seeing the slide, if you are not able to listen to me. So uh, any, any point of time, you can stop me. And another thing is that you will get all the presentations. Whatever I present here in PowerPoint, I will share all. And also some literature will be shared with you. And also I am doing the recording of this lecture and that will, will be made available to you. So you need not to bother about the uh, literature or things, you will get it. So now, as I told you that uh, adoption of modern chemical or industrial farming is started due to uh, invention or due to discovery of certain chemicals and fertilizers. So first, uh, you know, when these chemicals or modern tools of farming were developed. So first, uh, post, uh, first industrial revolution period in the world, you remember it was from 1760 to 1840. The industrial revolution, particularly in the Western country, Europe, America, and, and like. And in India, green and post green revolution period, you, you must be knowing that a lot of chemicals and fertilizers were used in agriculture during green revolution and after the green revolution. So there were a lot of technological developments uh, in industries like textile, steam, power. Steam power was employed. Uh, you know the story of James Watt and other people. George Stevenson made the engine, ex uh, this ex external combustion engine. And uh, because of this engine, you can say a lot of industrialization happened. These engines were used in many places to run the train, to uh, lift the coal from the mines, like lift, you know, lift was, variety of uses were made with this steam engine. Then iron making, invention of machine, tool, glass making, gas lighting, cement making, paper making, and mineral mining. A lot of uh, things or industries were developed due to industrial revolution. In agriculture also, it, it does not, uh, did not remain untouched. A uh, lot of inventions were made in agriculture also, like machines were started uh, uh, to be used by farmers for tillage, harvesting machines, spraying machines, transport in peace, and chemicals, pesticide, fertilizer, etc. were introduced in the Western countries' agriculture. And you know this uh, Jethro Tull, he invented the uh, horse drawn hoe and a seed drill with ties to sow the row crops. Sowing of crops in rows was started by Jethro Tull. And by middle of the 19th century, 
single super phosphate was manufacturing manufactured in england i think you might be knowing who uh, made this single super phosphate i think it was justus liebig justus uh, liebig uh, lewis I, i think i will confirm you who made this single super phosphate first time the first reactor internal combustion engine was made in usa in 1910 Haber and Bosch ammonia synthesis nitrogen fertilizer. So this is how development of uh, different inputs in agriculture started. DDT in 1939 by P. Moller in Switzerland and discovery of BSC in France. Uh, then nitrophenols were the first group of selective herbicides developed in 1933 and were followed by the development of 2,4-D MCPA in 1940s. So you can see in the early 20th century many chemicals and some uh, fertilizers were developed for agriculture therefore their use in agriculture started increasing so from these points onward the organic farming was practically abandoned by people and they started following chemical farming or industrial farming it can be named as industrial farming also now see justus von liebig developed the theory of mineral plant nutrition in 1840 many of you might be knowing the law of minimum was proposed by him and he developed this uh, theory of plant mineral nutrition and he has given certain principles and you might have uh, studied in some other courses about the contribution of justice von liebig he believed that mineral salts were the only nutrients plant needed and they could completely replace manure so at that time you know there were a lot of theories of mineral plant nutrition many people used to say that plant is getting its dry matter from water some were saying it is getting from air and some were saying it is getting from soil also and likewise he gave his uh, opinion that plants take up nutrients in mineral form they take nutrient in mineral form and these minerals can replace the manure you, you need not to add manure if you are able to add the uh, minerals he also propounded law of minimum which described the effect of individual nutrients on crops so law of minimum has been very very important and guiding principle in soil fertility management now uh, Uh, F. H. King of USA. He visited many uh, Asian countries, East Asian, East Asian countries, for, uh, and he wrote a book, Farmers of Forty Centuries, or Permanent Agriculture in China, Korea, and Japan. So on the right side, you can see this is a book by King F. H. King, and uh, the title is Farmers of Forty Centuries. or permanent agriculture in china korea and japan by uh, f h king in 1911 so these are some historical books which are related to organic farm so he was quite impressed by uh, farmers in china korea and japan they were doing practically organic farming so he has given a travel log travel log is kind of book kind of document that a person write while a traveling traveling in some places so travel log and description of observation of farming system during his travels in china korea and japan in early 1900 so in this book he has put some pictures also lot of pictures of uh, agricultural practices in east and then your rudolf stiegner you know about him he is uh, famous or called father of biodynamic agriculture or biodynamic farming so his uh, he did not write a book actually his uh, lectures were compiled by his disciples so he uh, delivered eight lectures in 1924 those were compiled he was founder of anthro anthros anthroposophy and father of biodynamic agriculture we will see the, this anthroso uh, anthroposophy anthros means human sophia means wisdom 
So anthroposophy means he defined it as a scientific exploration of the spiritual world. Scientific exploration of the spiritual world. In 1928, Demeter, the organization formed around Steiner's teaching, creating the set of standards to define sustainable agriculture practices. So he has uh, created certain set standards which was named as Demeter. Then what is biodynamic agriculture? Form of alternative agriculture akin to organic farming. It is similar to organic farming, but based on pseudo-scientific. Pseudo means not perfect. Pseudo-scientific and esoteric concepts of Rudolf Steiner. So they were raw concepts, some raw concepts. Uh, esoteric means very unusual and understood or liked by a, only a small number of people. So these principles of biodynamic agriculture was not universally adopted or adopted by the people and by the farmers. So it is uh, only his chela or only his uh, disciples who propagated and who adopted this biodynamic agriculture. In 1924, first of the organic agriculture movement was started in the name of biodynamic agriculture. And it treats soil fertility, plant growth, and livestock care as ecologically interrelated. Task emphasizing spiritual and mystical perspective. So this is the main uh, backbone of this uh, biodynamic agriculture that they treat soil fertility, plant growth, and livestock interrelated. Means ecologically interrelated and emphasizing is spiritual and mystical perspective. So some kind of uh, spicy thing. A spicy thing is spiritual and mystical perspective. That may not have uh, any scientific basis. It emphasizes the use of manures and compost, that is good, and excludes the use of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides on soil and plant. So this is also common in modern organic farming. But in modern organic farming, there is no place for spirituality. Uh, emphasis from its beginning on local production and distribution system, its use of traditional and development of new local breeds and varieties. Some methods use an astrological sowing and planting calendar. This is also there in India. Some people see these kind of things while doing different operations uh, in crop production or in agriculture. It also uses herbal and mineral additives for compost additives and feed sprays. Means they can mix some minerals in the compost and also burying ground parts stuffed into the horn of a cow which are said to harvest cosmic forces in the soil. So these are some of the unusual things that burying ground parts stuffed into the horn of a cow. You put this material into the horn of a cow that is not going to be decomposed very soon. Uh, biodynamic agriculture is a pseudoscience as it lacks scientific evidence for its efficacy. efficacy. But it's still in some countries like Germany and uh, uh, Switzerland, some people follow biodynamic farming. Next in the history is your uh, Lord Northumberland. Lord Northumberland from USA, he was the first to use the term organic farming in 1939. This may be a question for your quiz. And he wrote a book, Look to the Land, 1940. So these are actually classical books which are usually uh, referred. So what he said about it, the farm itself must have a biological completeness. Biological completeness, it must be a living entity. It must be a unit which has within itself a balanced organic life. So he was mainly concerned about the cycling or uh, cycling of the materials on the organic farm. And there should not be any need to buy inputs from outside. So farm itself is a complete unit 
and uh, which has within itself a balanced organic life. The book was Look to the Land, 1940. Then Lady Eve Balfour, United Kingdom from UK, she made wonderful contribution in the field of organic farming. She wrote a book, The Living Soil, 1943. As the title of the book suggests that she must have talked about microbial or uh, uh, living things in the soil. Spreading the organic philosophy globally, book, her book that is uh, The Living Soil inspired the founding of the Soil Association in Britain in 1946. She said that there is close relationship between soil fertility, human health, and decline in soil humus and fertility result in decline in human health. So to be very simple that soil health is related to human health. Nineteen forty-seven, doctors and consumers blame agricultural chemicals for causing the development of cancer and mental disorders. As early as certain consequences of organic farming were visible in Europe. So, in nineteen forty-seven, in France, there was the introduction of the principles of organic farming because doctors and consumers blamed agricultural chemicals for causing the development of cancer and mental disorders. So it was started very early in Europe. And at the same time, people started raising their eyebrows against the organic farm that it can lead to, uh, sorry, against the chemical farm. So there, there was some awareness against the chemical farm. Now came the GI Rodel. J.I. Rodell has been very important person. He was a publisher who used to, he, he has a publishing house and who used to publish dictionaries, thesaurus, magazines, books, etc. But he also had interest in organic farming. So he started a magazine, Organic Farming and Gardening in 1942. So scientists used to make contribution to this magazine. Uh, particularly, this uh, Albert Howard was very important contributor, contributor to this magazine, Organic Farming and Gardening. He was, uh, Jay Rodale was author as well as publisher, and he demonstrated organic farming and gardening technique on his research farm. So besides writing book, he also had one organic farm, and he was founder of the Rodale Press, he popularized the concept of organic farming in USA. And he also wrote a book, The Healthy Hunjas. I will tell you who are Hunja and why healthy uh, prefix before their names. So Hunjas have been a tribe in, in uh, Gilgit Partisan. We will discuss healthy Hunjas. He wrote the book 1948 from Rodel Press. 255 pages. In 1947, Rodel established the Soil and Health Foundation, which is now called as the Rodel Institute. So Rodel Institute is there in USA, which is totally devoted to do research and, or, on organic farming and also extension activities on organic farming by publishing literature, magazine, books, papers, etc. So one Rodale Institute is also there. You can see the website of the Rodale Institute. If you are interested to know more about this institute, so you just type Rodale Institute in Google, you will get the details of uh, this institute. Then, you know, all of you might be knowing about Mesa, uh, Mesa no Bu Fukuoka. M. Fukuoka from Japan. So I think we can uh, stop. I think it will continue for 40 minutes, up to 40 minutes. Uh, are you there, Kiran? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, okay. sir. Very good. So now you can see this farmer basically uh, from Japan, and he was also a philosopher. And he gave the word uh, book, he wrote the book. 
the one straw revolution and introduction to natural farming published in 1975 and it was translated into english in 1978 so initially it was written in uh, <clears throat> uh, japanese language then translated to english he wrote another book the natural way of farming the theory and practice of green flows uh, published in 1975 and translated in 1985 by some other people and he uh, professed no till no herbicide grain production techniques called as natural farming or do nothing farm so if you go into the details of his philosophy he was against the tilling of the land there is no need to go for plowing no herbicide application and he actually profess kind of uh, mixed cropping mixed cropping uh, you can broadcast the seed and let us wait for the time let the weeds grow and then after harvesting of the crop you can return the residues back into the soil so in brief you can say it was just kind of conservation agriculture he professed minus herbicides and chemicals Rachel Carson or Raquel Carson, the way you like, you can pronounce Raquel, Rachel Carson from US. She was marine biologist, author, and conservationist. She wrote a book, Silent Spring, 1962. She opened the world's eyes to the damage pesticides were doing to the environment. So she raised voice against the use of pesticides. And she blamed the industries of the chemical for spreading the incomplete information and government people accepting dictates of the industry. So she said that uh, because industries are getting, chemical industries are getting profit and they have some kind of uh, understanding with the politicians and they are spreading the people uh, this poison, which is affecting the environment. Another uh, person or couple, Hans Muller and Mary Muller from Switzerland, they were also proponents of organic farming. Uh, they called it organic biological agriculture. So different people have given different names to organic farming. Like just now we have seen Fukuoka, we have seen biodynamic agriculture. So different variants exist in organic farming, but common is that no chemical use is common to all. They worked closely with Hans Peter Rusch. This couple of Muller, Muller couple, they worked with Hans Peter Rusch, who was also proponent of organic farming. So he was their teacher actually, to develop a natural and sustainable approach to farming. And they named it organic biological agriculture. And see the Hans Peter Rusch, Rush from Germany. He wrote two books in German language. You can read this, it's difficult to read. But these two books are related to organic biological agriculture. He gave the concept of nature as a cycle of living particles, built the theoretical background of organic biological agriculture. So at most you can remember this, uh, that there was some scientist, Hans Peter Rush from Germany and who gave the concept of organic biological agriculture. Then came the modern time and when the IFOM was established. IFOM is International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. So this is actually international organization dealing with organic farming. This is non-governmental organization. This is not a, an official or governmental organization. This is uh, supported by NGOs and some uh, uh, partly by some governments, but it is not a government or official organization. It was initially established at Versailles in France in 1972, now headquartered at Bonn, Germany. So if uh, somebody asks a question that uh, when uh, where the iPhone was established or first time. So answer is France. And where it is headquartered now, it is in Germany, born Germany. 
It provides authoritative information about organic agriculture, promote worldwide and exchange knowledge. So this is basically dedicated for the promotion of organic farming and organic products. It also sets some standard of organic farming and uh, also organizes conferences, seminars, symposia, scientific discussion, field days, and fairs. Fairs of uh, organic fairs are also organized by IFOM. And they are also training people in organic farming. So this is about IFOM. And uh, if you have interest in organic farming, you must see the website of IFOM. Just type iPhone in Google, you will get the website and you can see the details, all details related to organic farming in the world. Publishing some literature also. Then comes the Meadows, Meadows et al. and, and friends or colleagues. A club of Rome, they named it Club of Rome in Italy. Now it is shifted to Switzerland. So they published the book the Limits of Growth, 1972. And they discussed the issue of growth of human population and global economy. They asked questions, what will happen if growth in the world population continues unchecked? What will be the environmental consequences if economic growth continues at its current pace? So they raised their voice against the increasing population and the diminishing resources. Then came E.F. Iskumaker from Germany. He authored the book, Small is Beautiful. Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered. So he has uh, considered the human face, human face of agriculture has to be there. So wrote many radical ideas in the book, above book, that is study of economics as if people mattered including the concept of sacrificing in economic growth for a more fulfilling working life and making quality of life the central goal of economics. Because if you go on instead of, uh, adding industries, adding industries to a country, to a, to a geographical area, of course, uh, people will get uh, So uh, we will start a new link. So dear students, you can see here a uh, picture of Mahatma Gandhi in this. So he, he gave honor to Mahatma Gandhi uh, in this book by putting his photo on the cover page of the book, you can see here. The fundamental message he wanted to give was, uh, because this Mahatma Gandhi was, I think, against the industries, big industries. He was in favor of small and portage, portage industries in the country. So therefore, message was that human life is more important than the economy. Economy or health is more important than the economy or money. Uh, next concept in 1970s, know your farmer. This concept is started, uh, know your farmer, know your food. Worldwide, in Western countries, US, Canada, Australia, and Europe. So they encourage the consumption of locally grown food. The main purpose was that you know that where from your food is coming, if you consume the local food. There is the promotion of this concept with slogans such as know your farmer, know your food. So this also encouraged organic farming. If you are going to buy or if you are going to a farm and if you see that farmers are using chemicals and so on, then you will not buy that food. So therefore, if you know your farmer and that is possible only when you consume local food. So you can know the food. So these kind of uh, campaign also helped promotion of organic farming over the industrial farming. Then 1980s group pressure for government regulation of organic production worldwide. 
then again some uh, people came forward to oppose the uh, industrial farming or chemical farming so throughout the world various farming and consumer groups seriously began to pressure their respective governments to regulate uh, the organic production this led to uh, legislation and certification standards being enacted through the 1990s and to date so many country were very early riser and some were late riser so but the things started in 1990s currently most aspects of organic food production are government regulated in major countries so in almost uh, uh, major countries of uh, of the world now organic farming is being regulated by their governments In 1989, Cuba institutes urban food production called organo organo ponicos. So there was the collapse of uh, Soviet Union, causing loss of economic support, resulted in a unique situation to develop in Havana, Cuba, organic food production in this. So some kind of movement is started in Cuba also about organic product as early as in 1989. then uh, retail market for organic farming started growing and at a very uh, fast pace that is 20% annually and what were the drivers in 1990s uh, quality and safety of food people were worried about the quality and safety of food therefore they wanted to buy organic product and potential for environmental damage some people had concern for environmental damage also therefore they wanted organic products so in 1991 european union provides a legal framework legal framework means certain uh, official uh, control of organic farm 2002 united states adopts the national organic program 2002 usa adopts the national organic program they call it nop the united states of america nop provided a development framework for organic agriculture now before this uh, uh, these developments uh, i want to just share some contributions of uh, uh, albert howard is uh, uh, basically a british person Englishman and uh, he worked in India for a very long time. And from 1905 to 1924, organic agriculture begins in Central Europe and India simultaneously. So he was instrumental in India. This Albert Howard. Of course, in his time, India was not that much uh, agriculturally advanced in the sense uh, chemical use sense of chemical use of fertilizer use but still actually he has seen farming in europe and america that time from 1905 onward the farming in us and uk and many developed countries was was basically chemical farm so he has seen the results of chemical farming from europe and america and found that uh, people are suffering or people suffer from Uh, chemical farming if they use those products environment also gets polluted so he was in favor of organic farm he also said that this uh, uh, chemical farming may not be sustainable if you want sustainable farming you must add humus or organic matter to the soil basically he was a plant botanist or you can say plant breeder in the modern terms so plant uh, agriculture botany was his subject and he came to indian agricultural research institute pusa bihar that time it was in bihar and uh, he started breeding wheat varieties but slowly he lost interest in wheat breeding and he uh, he was going to the fields of the farmer in bihar and other parts at that time it was bengal i think bengal and uh, he was quite inspired by indian farmers that this indian farming system 
that is organic farming is sustainable and farming in europe and america is not sustainable because it is chemical farming so he had his ideas and promoted organic farming in india the main contribution was uh, developing the process of composting and writing two two books on organic farming and lot of papers on organic farming so you can say he was proponent of modern organic farming or organic agriculture here i wish to tell you that uh, there is no difference if you call organic agriculture or organic farming these two words have same meaning the only difference is that in india we call uh, prefer calling organic farming in western countries they prefer calling organic agriculture otherwise there is no difference in these two terms so he is considered as the father of modern organic agriculture he worked at pusa then it was in bangal because bangal bihar was one province he documented traditional indian farming practices and came to regard them as superior to conventional agriculture in 1943 he wrote a book an agricultural testament so this is excellent book if you are interested i will share with you or you can also find a version of this book uh, through google an excellent book worth reading it is worth re reading very small book you can read in 2 3 days time so uh, i suggest you to go through it it will enrich your knowledge in 1947 uh, he also uh, he wrote another book the soil and health a study of organic agriculture so this is the complete title of the book the soil and health a study of organic agriculture so it is the first book to include organic agriculture in its title so you can say that first it was first book uh, having title organic agriculture so this is also available if you are interested so these are two books you can see an agricultural testament 1943 and soil health uh, soil and health a study of organic agriculture 1947 written by albert howard so his story was very simple that in in the beginning he worked in bor bihar or pusa and then uh, he shifted to indore the maharaja of indore gave him some land for experimental purpose and he established his experimental center there and he developed the method of composting which is known as indore composting method and it is aerobic compost this method of aerobic composting other method of composting is anaerobic composting that was given by c l acharya i think called as bangalore method of composting so there are two important method of composting so he came to agriculture research station or he made or developed the agricultural research station at indore where he gave aerobic composting technique known as indore process in 1933 and 1935 north american as well as british organic farming was fundamentally influenced by howard so howard was actually link between east and west uh, he was working in east he has had experience of west he had seen the chemical farming or industrial farming in europe and america he has also seen the consequences of that farming consequences with respect to environmental pollution and decreased human health and decreased soil health so he was just kind of link between two kind of farming and he was uh, for the organic farm so north american as well as british organic farming was influenced by howard by reintegrating the different agricultural research disciplines he concluded that the health of the soil plants animals and humans are interrelated so this is the most important uh, statement by him now uh, i ask you how can you prove that health of soil plants animals and humans are interrelated 
This is a question to you. Please come forward and give your views. How the health of soil, plants, animals, and humans are interrelated? Why it is so? Why it is true? Is it true? If so, then why it is true? Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir, if, we, if you use uh, some uh, chemical pesticides on to the soil, then uh, then it also goes to the plant and it uh, it res it's residue found in plant which uh, which feed by the animal and it get accumulated in the animals also and it uh, it affects the health of the animal and uh, if a, any a humans eat uh, the plants or animal it will also accumulated in the animal or humans body which uh, also will affect the health of the humans good. that's why it's all, all are interrelated yeah, that is good. Yeah, any other, uh, somebody want to add something more? Uh, any other student want to add something more? What he said is correct. But that is not complete actually. So he has talked about the uh, negative effect of chemicals or pesticides. So if your soil is having pesticides, these pesticides can go to the plant. And first thing is that these pesticides will affect the health of the soil adversely. If the health of soil is affected adversely, then the health of the plant will be affected adversely. How these pesticides can affect soil health adversely? Because these pesticides can be dangerous to the animal and plant life in soil, which is very useful for cycling, recycling, decomposition in, of organic matter in soil. So microbial ecology of the soil will be affected by pesticides. So if the health of the soil is reduced, you will get health of the plant reduced. And then those who are dependent upon this plant, it will affect them. So this is uh, related to pesticides. That pesticides can directly be part of the food. They can be absorbed by the plant when you go for foliar spray or soil application. And then they will reach the food chain, leads the human beings through the food chain. This is one aspect. Another aspect is soil health itself, means the fertility, fertility of the soil. So if your soil is healthy, means it is having all kind of nutrients. If, if nutrients, some nutrients are missing, we cannot call it uh, healthy soil. So healthy soil with respect to uh, it needs to be safe. It, it should not have pesticide. This is one aspect. Another thing is that it should have all the necessary or essential nutrients in adequate and sufficient amount. And it should, it should also have biological health. There can be three kinds of soil health. One is biological, other is chemical, and physical soil health. So all these kind of health should be good. So overall, you can see that health of soil, plant, animal, humans are interrelated. A humus rich soil is the key for successful organic farming. Now see one more person, one more contributor towards uh, organic farming in India. And he was contemporary of uh, Albert Howard, and again a British national. And he was some brigadier or colonel or major. He was basically a doctor. But in Indian Army, Indian Army or British Army, whatever you call, the army which was there in India at that time, he was doctor there. And his name is Robert McCarrison, established the Institute of Nutrition in 1918. So now this uh, institute has been elevated to National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad, part of CSIR, Council of Scientific and industrial research. So originally, this was a single room laboratory at the Pasture Institute. The name of the institute was Pasture Institute in India, in Kunnur, Tamil Nadu. In that institute, they got one room lab for the study of beriberi and was called the beriberi inquiry unit. 
So this is how genesis of National Institute of Nutrition Hyderabad happened. So the facility moved to Hyderabad in 1958, and in 1969 it was renamed the National Institute of Nutrition. It is still existing in Hyderabad, doing wonderful work, and they are also contributing towards organic farming research. Besides conventional product, they also deal with the organic products. This National Institute of Nutrition, as the name suggests. they are dealing with the nutritional composition of food so robert mackerison uh, nutrient research laboratory in kunur nilgiri district he started in one room uh, so what he studied relationship among soil fertility food quality and human nutrition almost same kind of line of work as was uh, with uh, uh, albert hover so what he said mackerison there is decreased food quality due to increased use of mineral nitrogen fertilizer if we increase the nitrogen fertilizer in soil they will decrease the food quality he was of the opinion and published his work he also studied the health and physic of the hunja tribes men so jai rodel studied hunja tribe mac carison also studied hunja people so hunja is a tribe people and they it has been a subject of study by many scientists why they live for so long their life um, they live very longer more than 100 years old people are there it is still there so so you can see uh, you cannot see here this picture very clearly but he studied uh the diet and physic of indian races indian races so he found maratha people sikh people pathan people nepali hillmen tibet hillmen and different indian races bengali diet so he compared all kind of diets important diets sikh diet maratha diet pathan diet and so on so actually the food constitution of different diets was different so he has taken uh, these food diets and fed to the uh, rats fed to the rats you can see the rats and then he made some conclusions based upon this study of rats uh so he said that a uh, sick diet sick diet was better than uh even the european diet because sick diet was rich in proteins rich, rich rich in maybe chicken or maybe in proteins and fat and so on. so he uh, based upon his study on the rats he fed different diets to the rat and he made certain conclusion they are not uh, in uh, not taking them in detail it is just to tell you that uh, human uh, food studies are made on the rat cells food studies are made on the rat cells now see about hunja tribe i will discuss uh, this uh, in detail tomorrow so this lecture ends here and now your questions are welcome